This week on Crossfeed. Bible reading and science. Chain World, the religion video game. Marcus Bachman and litter bombing. The end of Lutheran social services. And is Pastafarianism becoming a religion? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crossfeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, fresh from Camp Pine Shore in central Massachusetts, and now back safely in Dedham. Welcome, everybody. Uh, took a week off last week. Jim was at camp. taking. I said that we were going to take this week off, but I have my dates wrong. I'm taking next week off. They're actually going to be um, paving our driveway. Um, or not, well, not paving it, patching it and sealing it and, you know, restriping things and all that kind of stuff. So, lousy time to be on a staycation. So, but yeah, it is what it is. So, it is what it is. Uh, we had an awesome time at Camp Pine Shore, except it was very hot and didn't have any air conditioning up there. Uh, so it was, uh, but we had a lake and went swimming every day, and you know that was a good way to cool off and everything. But otherwise, just had an awesome time with the kids, and um, look forward to being up there again next year. Cool. Well, I had a, an interesting week in that um, I had a meeting um, involving the uh, as for, with our vision task force for transforming congregations, and. Um, I've, I've had a, a bunch of different things that I've been working on, uh, putting together, a, a starting up a contemporary service and, um, and, uh, starting up a, a major discipleship kind of program to replace confirmation class and things like that. And so I've just had a lot of things that I've been working on and, um, and our, our congregation coach knew all the stuff that, that I have going on. And he said, you're spreading yourself too thin, um, you really need to just set that stuff aside at least until you get um until you get your congregation's vision and um and I went huh <laughs> and uh and I I I just I was really stressed and 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 he said yeah um you know this is really hard for you isn't it and I said yeah cuz you know it's one thing to when someone says hey can you help me out with this and I said yeah sure but then when when someone says hey can you stop doing this you know the stuff that's that's good things but you know stop doing it for a while and it's like ah oh, I've, I've had this all sort of mapped out of what's when and you know and stuff but at the same time, I, you know, I, I, I agreed to it after, um, taking some time to pray about it and, um, and realized that this is really what I, uh, you know, it, it was really sound advice and, um, and it was, he wasn't the first person to tell me that either. So, um, it was, you know, it, it was sort of the, the wake up call that I needed and, um, so it's hard to back off because, you know, I've, I've got, one thing about being here in North Rachel is I've just had just tremendous, tremendous ministry opportunities. It's just like the sky's the limit and, and, uh, there's just so many different things that, that we can be doing and, and stuff. And it's just, it's such a joy. It's, it's so exciting and, and stuff. And, you know, for someone to say back off, it's like, why wow, there's, you know, there's so much to do and, you know, people to reach and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, no, you got to slow down. Like, no, I don't want to slow down. <laughs> but you know, I have to recognize my own limitations too, and not uh, you know. I gotta remember be fair the to my words. Family too. Remember the words of the great hymn: "Slow down, you move too fast." <laughs> Feeling groovy. Yeah, yeah, that one must be in your hymnal. <laughs> hey, you know, it's got to be in somebody's hymnal anyway. <laughs> So, Possibly, um, you know, that new ELCA hymnal. <laughs> could be. Could be. Or maybe the Chain World video game hymnal. Let's start there. I'm just not allowed to do transitions, am I? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I thought about doing that. Well, I don't know. You you want to talk about... I don't want to talk about the ELCA first. 
Okay. I want to get the story that I sat there and said, this guy is really stupid. Um, <laughs> Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, sir. I mean, I don't pick these things for people, I tell you. So I thought this was fascinating. All right? So, um, here's a, a this is really c- kind of convoluted. Um, but kinda. We'll... <laughs> <laughs> it took me about 15 minutes to read through the, through the story. Um, all right. So a uh, guy by the name of Jason Rohrer, who is, um, he's a game, a video game designer. And um, he uh, created a video game um, from a, a challenge uh, to, to create a, uh, it's the, um, Game Design Challenge, the 2011 Game Design Challenge at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. All right. Um, three game designers compete to make a video game that does some crazily ambitious thing that a video game is not supposed to be able to do, like tell a love story or win the Nobel Peace Prize. And the designers get about six weeks to come up with a concept or prototype based on the theme chosen by the organizers, and they get 15 minutes to pitch it to a live audience. Right. Whoever receives the most applause is declared the winner. Right. And so, um, what he ended up creating is, um, a hack of the game, uh, where is it? Minecraft. Um, which is, is sort of a build your own city kind of game for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, and it's it's available. I mean, you can play it for free. It's a uh, advertising kind of thing. Um, but uh, so what he did is he created one called a game called Chain World, where um, you play it and you you sort of build things in that world and and interact with that world. And there's uh, things that come and attack you and stuff. And but there's rules with this game that make it unique. First of all, there's only one copy of this game, and it's on a USB. Um, memory stick and um, and then after you play that game you can play it exactly once and when you die you have to stop and um, and save the game and then pass it on to somebody else and um, and you're not allowed to talk well here where's the here, the Nine Commandments of Chain World. Um, you run it via one of the included launchers um, on this memory stick. Then you start a single-player game, pick Chain World, play until you die exactly once. Erecting signs with text is forbidden. Your works must speak for themselves. Remember, you're building stuff in the game. All right? And suicide is permissible. Um, number four, immediately after dying and respawning, quit to the menu. Five, allow the world to save. Six, exit the game and wait for your launcher to automatically copy Chain World back to the USB stick. Seven, pass the USB stick to someone else who expresses interest. Eight, never discuss what you saw or did in Chain World with anyone. And nine, never play again. I never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. Okay, so what does this have to do with religion? Oh, bye. By the way, this is the nutcase who A, does not believe in vaccination. B... Names his kids Mez and Aza. Mez he got from a um, license plate, and Aza he got from mixing up Scrabble tiles. Yep. <laughs> so what does this have to do with anything about religion? I could not make put A and B together. All right. So the um, th- each each year this game design challenge is based on some sort of a theme, all right? And so the theme for this year was... Um, I even wrote theme music. Yeah, listen. <clears throat> hey. Uh, where is it? It was more popular than Jesus, and it was to um, basically create something... Um, find a happy place! Find a happy place! Find a happy place! Something related to religion somehow. Bueller? Um... Bueller? No, I can't find it. Bueller? Um, he's sick. 
My best friend's sister's boyfriend's and, uh, brother's girlfriend heard from this guy who knows this kid is going with the girl who saw Ferris pass out at 31 Flavors last night. I guess oh, here. it's pretty serious. Bigger than Jesus, games as religion. All right. So, um, and the game designer, Rohrer, is an atheist, by the way. Um, basically, what he was trying to do was create a game that would be a religion or there at least would act like a religion. And he was, so he, in his sort of pitch speech for this game, he talks about how, uh, his grandfather, um, had, had held out when they were building a, uh, uh, freeway and they ended up, they, he wouldn't get rid of his house. And so they ended up having to, to route the freeway around his house. And, um, and he said, you know, in a sense, he was sort of like a god in that he altered um, the the actions or, or the environment around him. I, that's the part that kind of lost me because I thought, that's not a god. <laughs> Everybody alters the world around them, you know. So it's it sounds it sounds almost like like a, a sort of atheist version of New Age. Where you're saying, well, you create your own reality, you know, with Lego blocks, you know, is kind of the idea. Um, but in the, in this sense, you are sort of, with this game, you sort of become a, a god in this game that you're, that you're creating things. But at the same time, you're not really a god, you're more like a stonemason. Um, and, uh, but, it, you know, so really, in a sense, what we have here is, that is someone who really knows very little about religion trying to mimic religion. Right. And I can't figure out how he's doing this. You get your one chance to play this thing. I think these people are just really weird. Um, this one guy and I in, uh, on IGN gushed, On Friday, March 4th, I witnessed something incredible. I feel desperately sad that I will almost certainly never see Chain World but overjoyed that it's out there somewhere, evolving in secret. Yeah, uh-huh. That's really incredible. Some guy holds up a stick. You have no idea what's on it, no idea what it does. He gives it to one one person, who, by the way, decided to promptly start charging for it. Yeah, <laughs> which is kind of ironic because, like, well, if you become the god of that world, then you can do whatever you want with it. That's one of the perks of being God, you know, <laughs> but the the designer wasn't real happy about it. <laughs> no, well, and, and maybe maybe it shows how stupid people can be about religion, because for the right to play a used video game exactly once, somebody who calls herself Positional Super Co. agreed to pay three thousand three hundred dollars. Now, this is what we call a waste of money. <laughs> now, to her credit. She paid that money, but there was a, a condition on it that the guy said that, that the money was going to go to charity. And uh, so uh, the proceeds benefit Gamers Give Back, which provides free video game systems to sick kids. It's like a video game version of um, of uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. And... Uh, but it's it's sort of you know you get kids that are stuck in the hospital or whatever here we're gonna get you a video game system that um that'll help you pass the time sort of thing um right. my my now they have all these different thoughts about this that they have, you know what's it have to do with religion one person says nothing one person says religion is dumb um that, that this this game it reflects the sickness. To death, that that's religion, a lethal blend of megalomaniacal stoplicism, paranoid schizophrenia, platonic idealism, banal pyramid schemes, authentic grassroots collectivism, and good old fashioned resentment. Ah, uh, my goodness, what a nice guy there. Um, and then I like that the other guys, Roar and other art gamers take themselves way too seriously. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. If you're going to put this thing out in the wild and say, hey, whatever, do whatever you want with it, you know, and then you get mad when you the random person that you handed it to decides to, um, and I mean, now you have to understand, when this guy um, 
that uh, that decided to charge for it. You know, he had some ideas in mind. He was thinking, you know, this is we could do some interesting sort of uh, do a sort of case study on this and and things like that. And um, you know, so so he it wasn't that he just said, oh, I could make some money off of this. Which I mean, realistically, he could have really made himself. Um, you know, he could have just taken that money and and that and um for for something that's that could over time really become uh you know a sort of urban not an urban legend um because it's true but uh you know to to really have something in the um you know a lot of people talking about it and and stuff like that um people claiming that they played it and you know I don't know. I, you know, the other thing is what's to, what's to keep you, I mean, what's to keep you keeping the commandments? Right. How do you yeah. know that when people are going to play it once? I don't know. I think, it, I think there's some people out there who've got way too much time on their hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause here's the thing with God. Uh, if you're going to give people commandments, yeah. If you're going to have, and this goes with anything. Actually, not just being God. If you're going to have rules, they have to be enforceable. Otherwise, they're not rules. Right. And he has no way to enforce this because once he lets it go, he can't track it. Right. So, I don't know what his problem is. Um, But maybe he should become Pastafarianism. Pastafaria. Okay. Right. Again, this is, I thought, was one of the... Stupidest stories I've ever read. Uh, I can't figure this out. So there's this course, court in Austria, and there's I mean there's this guy in Austria, Nico Alm, and he wanted to wear a pasta strainer on his head because he says he's pastafarian, a member of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And they said okay, not because he was grant, being granted any kind of religious exemption but because it did not cover his face. So if you want to wear a pot, I mean, my mind would be the same thing wearing, you want to wear a baseball cap in your your uh, uh, license picture, go ahead. You want to put a pasta thing on your head, go ahead. And somehow or another, you know, from there he's going to, you know, petition the Austrian government to recognize the flying spaghetti monster as a valid religion. How you get from A to B, I don't know. Maybe we can make baseball a religion. Well, here's the problem. The problem is he was trying to basically he wanted them to tell him, no, you can't do it. And he didn't realize that, oh, well, actually, you can do it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no rules against wearing a hat. (laughs) Right. He was trying to protest women wearing headscarves as as a religious exemption. Um, to the rules and, and, you know, basically he's complaining about it. a lot of what, uh, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is all about is these sort of exceptions that are made for the sake of religion. Um, like for instance, uh, it, it, it started out from, um, teaching intelligent design in Kansas schools, um, which even there they, they, the irony with the flying spaghetti monster is that the um the guy that started it doesn't understand the difference between intelligent design and young earth creationism so um you know so that right there is the the biggest flaw with the whole thing but you know if if they're trying to push creationism then he he have to some degree a case um but uh but intelligent design just says it was intelligent design we don't know who did it So, actually, here, idiot, it could be the Flying Spaghetti Monster if you talk to the intelligent designers, because they're not saying who the designer is. Right, right. It is is Plato's first mover, prime mover. You know, he never just, he said was God. He never said who God was. Mm -hmm. You know, as I told the kids last week, creation shows us God exists. It does not tell us who that God is or what he's like. It could very well be the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Right. So, but he couldn't say that. No, for him, it's creationism in non-religious terms. Yeah. 
Well, and, and that's a lot of the problem with, with these sort of discussions is this, oh, well, you want to, this is, you know, you, you want to have, uh, intelligent design because then that's just a step in the direction toward creationism. Like, no, that's not it. Uh, it's the fact that if you look at the fact that there's life on earth and you start adding up all of the things that were necessary, um, to happen at just the right times to make life appear on earth and especially complex life, not just bacteria. It's like buying a lottery ticket and winning and then going out and, and spending one of the dollars you won on another lottery ticket and winning over and over and over every single time and never losing. All right. That's the point of intelligent design is saying, look, there are things that our universe, you know, could not exist. And, and you know, and the other thing is when you talk about prime mover, right? There is no explanation for what caused the universe to come into being. All right. You can say the big bang, but, Nobody can explain what caused the Big Bang to actually go. Right. What flipped the switch? And uh, and there, there's no because you you can't say that it's, it's just expanding and contracting and that it's happening over and over, right? Because all systems, given time, slow down and eventually stop without some sort of external force being acted on them. Yes, that is what is known as the laws of thermodynamics. There is a finite amount of energy, and that energy is always running down. So, um, now the other thing that uh, with the whole um, uh, sort of postafarianism thing is that they've they've gone on to be more than just about uh, sort of uh, intelligent design and, and evolution and, and you know and, and all that kind of stuff is and what they have done is any th any exceptions that are made for religion um the the they tend to sort of jump on those things and um so so for instance we have this guy that he was trying to protest uh the religious head coverings worn by muslim women all right um we've got uh there's a example um, that they give here that it's not something specifically mentioned by um, uh, the Pastafarians, but it's it's really sort of another example of somebody using religion to to get an exemption. It's kind of the opposite side of the coin. Uh, this is actually a story that we talked about. Um, Ariana uh, Iacono of North Carolina, who sued her school district over her right to wear a nose ring in school. She's because she's a member of the Church of Body Modification. So the interesting thing about this is th what they're talking about is um, what constitutes a religion, right? Is it, um, you know, and the thing is, we're looking at this, you know, from, uh, how, give me a legal definition of religion, right? And And if you talk about people's beliefs, well, everybody's got different beliefs. And, um... And if you start, you know, what, how do you define what's a religious belief and what's not a religious belief? And, um, and so then they said, you know, uh, the point is that, that a religion is, it's a collection of people that, um, that have beliefs and practices that unite them. But the irony here is that the, um, Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is actually becoming that. Because so many people um, believe in the sort of philosophy of of this, They're, the irony is that most of them are atheists or agnostics, and um, but the whole thing is that they are um, it is that they don't believe that exceptions should be made based on religion. That's that's really what it comes down to, and so in a sense, you could argue that they are against the First Amendment of the Constitution that guarantees freedom of religion. Freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Yep. Now, one thing I didn't know, that I did, I, I did learn one thing from this article. I didn't know that the Pastafarians are the ones responsible for Talk Like a Pirate Day. 
<laughs> Would you get going, you pirate? Because I'm a big fan of Talk Like a Pirate Day. So, uh, so that's that's a new one by me. I, I was not aware of that. So I, I wasn't aware of it either, and uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, you know, I'd, I'd ask the question, you know, you know, you can't claim we have a religion that wouldn't, but we're, no, it's really believe it. Okay. Do you really mm-hmm. believe there actually is a flying spaghetti monster out there somewhere? Do you pray to it? Well, do you, you know, well, no, I don't believe in anything. Well, then don't tell me you have a religion. Right. You you, you have a satire, but you don't have a religion. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so, you know, please don't say that, you know, that, that, that this is a, you know, I mean, it's hard, it's hard for me to take a, a uh, 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 seriously, an article about the the flying spaghetti monster becoming a religion and a uh, um, journal that's really atheist in its position. So, you know, I just you know, interestingly, we've talked about the Jedi religion, and that one is actually much more. You know, the people there are actually sincere adherents to it. Right. Well, I, ultimately, um, Jediism is just a uh, uh, ersatz version of uh, Zen Buddhism. It's really not that different. I mm-hmm. mean, and George Lucas says that. You know, I mean, it's it's he, he he says you know we're all Zen Buddhists up here. Yeah, he'll he'll say that much. Um, and it's not a you know, but actually got something there to it but let's do this one on last one here on uh frequent bible readings and then we'll go deal with the 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 two well the 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 the, the lutherans and then the used to be lutherans okay all right so this is a this was an interesting article and and i think even more interesting that it's in the huff post right but you know this seems a little bit um counterintuitive to most people. Yeah, you know, it says, What mm-hmm. daily practice may help American Christians become more concerned about issues of poverty, conservation, and civil liberties? Answer, reading the Bible. Uh, and I think absolutely. Yeah, I went, duh. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, you know, again, what it has this idea is that if you are more religious... You, you know, then, you know, you, you, you pray, you read the Bible regularly, then that puts you into the religious right, Republican, whatever. And there, of course, you don't care about poverty, conservation, and civil liberties. On the other hand, if you aren't, then you're the one of the more secular progressive people who care about poverty, conservation, and civil liberties. Talk about people who do not know history. Hey, guys, who were some of the main people fighting slavery in America? It was the Christians who owned slaves. It was the non-Christian Jefferson. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, uh, where in the meantime, uh, uh, people like William Wilberforce, and uh, you know, who was highly, very evangelical in uh, England, was very strong against fighting the slave trade. In America, uh, there the, the uh, Methodists, Methodists were very strong in fighting the slave the slave trade. Uh, there, there's a huge amount of, of of evidence that Christian groups were involved in 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 do, in, in all kinds of things. Um, there's there was a book it used to be called Under the Influence, but it has a different name now. Written by uh, Al Schmidt, uh, who is a sociologist, and he intervenes how Christianity changed a lot of societies for the better. You know, by creating orphanages, by creating um, homes for unwed, unwed moms by be, building hospitals, uh, ending Chinese foot binding for women, uh, fighting against uh, female genital mutilation, um, I, showing support and respect for all life. Yeah, uh, and the list goes on. I mean, there's a reason that so many of the hospitals in this country either have or originally had Christian names, Saint Somebody or... Good Shepherd or, you know, whatever, 
right? Why? Because they were started by Christians. Eventually, some of them got bought out or, or whatever, you know, and the, the names changed. But, um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's just, that's reality. I know, and, and see, that one seemed like a no-brainer to me. Um, but the thing that I, that I think was a little more surprising, not to me personally, um, but I think that, that would surprise a lot of people based on stereotypes is that, um, not only this idea of, of seeking social and economic justice and that, um, but also that, um, let me find the exact quote here. Um, great, now I can't find it. Um, that uh, those who read their Bibles frequently also um, see no problem uh, connecting science and um, and God. Your scientific jargon staggers me, Pinky. Because we know every scientist that has ever existed in the Western world was an atheist. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, like you know, um, I'm, Isaac Newton. Um, you know, Gregor Mendel. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and, and all your all your hardcore, like, mathematicians and that, like, uh, you know, Blaise Pascal and, you know. Uh, I mean... Well, for that matter, um, 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 oh, who's the, the guy that the classification system, the biologist, oh, name escapes me, the guy that the kingdom phylum, um, all that. I don't know. I remember <laughs> the guy at one time who was a member who, 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 uh, was in charge of the human uh, genome project was, was an active Christian. Yeah. Well, ironically with him, he was not a Christian. He became a Christian. While he was involved in that project, or or possibly right before it, but but it was he was sort of he was a, a major geneticist. I think he's now uh, Obama just um, hired him to be something. Right, but the key thing is, I mean, you know, it's 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 you just kind of like what planet are you you people on? You know, mm -hmm. but then I recall back uh, about ten years ago, there was an article in Newsweek, and it was called, you know, it was, you know, creationists in the laboratory, and you know how they have this ideology that God created things, but yet they're able to be scientists anyway, and 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 and, and you know, it was just like you know, bang on the table, evolution is true, you know, there is no God, it all happened by itself, and if you believe in anything else. Well, you're absolutely crazy, but, you know, even these crazy people somehow know they get PhDs in science and, and work in laboratories. Mm -hmm. You know, I just uh, had uh, lunch, uh, dinner a week ago with uh, a young woman who was in my very first confirmation class I ever taught. She was in seventh grade, first year at seminary. And now she is a PhD. She's a uh, biomedical researcher, and she is uh, in charge or her, yeah, she, she heads up a group at her company, which is, um, working to convert all the medical records in the United States into electronic data formats. Well, she's involved in that, huh? Yeah. That's a big project. Yeah. And so she was out here for some big conference and doing something on things with, with, with cancer research and putting, you know, and stuff. I was, I was kind of vague on all the details, but I mean, you know, she's, and yet she's in church every Sunday. She's active in Bible study, you know, and her faith has a very important part of her life, and yet she's a major scientist. Mm hmm Yeah. Oh, here's the, um, reading the Bible more often was also linked to improved attitudes towards science. Respondents were 22% less likely to view religion and science as incompatible at each step toward more frequent Bible reading. In other words, um, when you go from... I read the Bible once a year to I read the Bible once a month, 22% less likely to see them as incompatible. Going from once a month to once a week or, or more than once or several times a week, it, you know, it, it drastically, um, the more a person reads the Bible, the more they see compatibility between the two. Right. 
So, um, I mean, now think about that, though. All right. What does that mean? That means that people that are saying that the two are incompatible are the people that don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the Bible. So, so they're, so where are they getting this idea from? From people that don't know the Bible. Not from the Bible itself. Yeah, it's interesting. And there's an anthropology professor, James Beale, at Miami University. And he wrote a book, an ethnography of an evangelical group Bible study. And he said, well, yeah, this is exactly what happens. He said, uh, you know, as individuals read the Bible, often the context of other influences, such as a local group or their spouse or children or study guide, frequently people come to a new position or find a nuance in what they already thought. It's ultimately, they would say, all truth is God's truth. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and that's the idea that, that we can go and do uh, um, uh, archaeological study. Um, just as a probably the most obvious example, and not have to worry about what we're going to find, because we, since we believe that the Bible is true, then we expect that what we are going to find is going to agree with the Bible, and we're not afraid that we're going to find something that disagrees with it. And um, it's not that we're out to prove it. We don't have to prove anything. We know it's true, right? But um, you know. So there's, it's it's not like, and that doesn't go just for archaeology, right? That goes for any science, right? Since we know that the Bible is true, that means that we can explore the universe, we can explore our world, we can explore, you know, the the atoms and and, and quantum physics and and all kinds of things, and what we're gonna find is not gonna contradict what God has revealed to us, but rather it is going to show us how great God is, you know? And so that's one of the questions that, um, that a, a fellow pastor asked me, and he's got some uh, NASA scientists um, at his church. And, and he said, you know, I got the question, all right, if you, um, if you accept, and you know, so by the way, yeah, NASA scientists that are, you know, teaching Sunday school and, and stuff like that. All right. Um, they said, you know, if you, if you believe creationism, um, and it was not necessarily young earth, old earth. That wasn't really the question, but he was saying, you know, does that prevent you from doing science? Is, does that cause you to say, well, God did it. And then you just stop. No, you know, creation science is all about, okay, yes, I believe God did it, but how did he do it? Let's look at the evidence, you know? And, and so, you know, people get this idea that, um, that when you say, well, God did it, then you just stop. But, you know, we say we have this incredible, amazing God. And so, um, so how did he do all this stuff? You know, I've been, um, you know, reading some stuff lately about the multiverse that, um, you know, they believe that they, they find actual evidence in the universe that there's quite possibly more than one universe. Uh, and, and even probably, uh, because there's certain, um, uh, physical pulls that like gravity, is um is stronger than it should be and um and and so and they're trying to figure that out and they're saying you know there's a possibility that there's other universes that are actually having uh you know in, enacting forces on our universe you know and and that's it's it's really hard to wrap your head around but at the same time it's amazing and it, and it just makes me go wow and and I always said that you know that God is bigger than our universe and and He created the whole universe and how amazing is that? Well, what if He created like a whole bunch of universes? Does that somehow diminish Him? No, it, it's wow. If if that's the case, he, He's even bigger than I thought. <laughs> you know. So, you know, this isn't this isn't something that that christians fear that's why i always say when the um you know when you become a christian don't check your brain at the door keep thinking back off man i'm a scientist yep so okay well let's move on here to the lutherans and the former lutherans um yeah hey, let's deal with the former lutherans first 
This has been a weird week for the Bachmans. <laughs> what can we say? That it has. First, the national media discover that Lutherans have believed the Pope is the Antichrist for 500 years. <laughs> Which we covered. We covered that story, like what, a year ago? No, two or three years ago, back when That's she ran for um, um, the House of Representatives last time. But now it got picked up by the Daily Caller and was made national. And, uh, you know, the po- uh, uh, Protestants and Catholics have a different understanding of the role of the Pope. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that? Well, <laughs> well, the other thing is that if you remember back to when we talked about that, when when she was a, when Michelle Bachman was a, approached on that, she went, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> she had no idea. You know, it's not the sort of thing that we talk about very often. Not because right. we're ashamed of it or anything, but because it's not a big deal. <laughs> it's not something that, that we focus on. Okay, so there's that. There's that side of it. Well, anyway, to you know. And I had read some of her stuff, and I'm like, mm, she doesn't strike me as real Lutheran here. Mm-hmm. And actually, she has not been attending a Lutheran church for two years. She's actually been going to a non-denominational church. And uh, just before she um, ended her, uh, just before she um, launched her presidential campaign, she um, um, re- uh, 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 resigned from the Lutheran congregation requested a release. Uh, yeah, requested a release, and that was you know, and that was kind of funny. It's kind of like, oh, that was granted just before she became president. Well, that was the, ran for president. Well, that was when the con- the church council got around a meeting. She'd actually you know written for it sometime before, but oh well. Anyway, well, her husband is a um uh, um. A, a, a mental health therapist. He actually has a rather large practice. Uh, now, he's been accused of all sorts of really evil things. Number one, taking Medicaid patients. You know, that's, you know, because, you know, she's not in favor of Obamacare and she's got problems with other, you know, socialized medicine things. But, you know, so he's evil for taking Medicaid patients, which, of course, I guess that meant that'd be a good thing if he, you know, refused to see Medicaid patients and let these people just go without treatment. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that like, hmm? You know, I'll bet. I'll bet he reads his Bible. I bet. Well, one of his thing is though he also uh, is into reparative therapy with gay people. Now, he says he does not believe that this works with everyone. He believes it works with a certain segment. And if somebody comes to him and says, I, you know, really don't like being gay, I don't want to be gay, he will work with that person to try to change. No, we're not homosexual, but we are willing to learn. I struggle with that concept myself. However, there is, there there are some people I think it may be possible. Um, uh, there may be, there are some people who may have, uh, you know, participated in homosexual acts, but really are not gay. They do that, for example, in prisons. Um, mm-hmm. or there may be some people, and I had a member who had to deal with one, uh, who was a psychiatrist and the guy felt terribly guilty about being gay, you know, but for some reason, because they have nothing better to do. And somewhere or another, he... He said something about gays being barbarians. I'm not sure exactly what the context of Who that was. Who need to be disciplined. But yeah, there's no, this is off a of gawker, which is, you know, um, it's sort of a, uh, sort of a tabloid. Um, uh, but, the, but that quote actually was in the Boston Herald today. So, um, uh, but the, yeah, you know, but the, it's really hard to, to, to do it because I, I, I'd even, I, I'd like to find in, um, I, I, I'd like to find for the Boston Globe person, what is your, your, the, 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 where he said this? Cause I can only find it quoted in Gawker. So, um, 
But anyway, so there's a bunch of gay, a, a, a bunch of gay folks dressed up as barbarians who decided to show up at the clinic and wanted to, you know, talk with him. Yeah, I'm sure you have a whole gang there who really want to talk. Um, well, they said they wanted him to discipline him. Yeah, whatever that means. Well, and so they decided to engage in some basic vandalism and uh, throw glitter around and saying, I can't change. I was born this way. This is what we call grown-up, mature behavior. Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is it... This is what we... Yeah, is it, is it, this is what, um, you know, the, they're trying to say that this is, well, this is, this is what chimpanzees do. So maybe this is a plug for evolution. <laughs> this, this is being wonderfully open-minded about our thoughtful behavior of how, what people are going to think. So, you know, this is called having a mature disagreement with people. Yeah. Or something like that. Well, if there's a bright center of the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. <sighs> right, here's the thing. The, I, I look at this and I say, you know, I've, I've got a lot of gay friends and um, and I, I haven't asked them how they feel about all this glitter bombing. Um, because this isn't the first time this has happened. This happens to be the first time that it happened at his place. But, um, when the, the Bachmans, both of them have been subject to attack by these sort of glitter bombs, um, uh, at various times, it's, it's, uh, you know, people are just going around doing this because they're really offended by this, um, by this sort of therapy. Um, and, you know, the, re It's it's one I I asked a friend of mine who's gay, um, about why. All right, if people don't want to be gay, and so and 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 they willingly seek out, um, a, a therapist who will help them deal with that or, or help them see if if they can you know change them or or whatever, um. If if they're seeking them out looking for this help, what is the problem with it? And um, he sent me a link to a uh, uh, a story that was sort of a uh, undercover expose where uh, he was actually a straight guy goes to a camp. That's uh, it's like a, a weekend retreat sort of thing um, for for gay men that don't want to be gay. And it, I mean, it was really weird. And I, I, I read this, the story and I went, okay, I don't think that most of the ones out there are like this. And if they are, the problem is not with, um, at that point, then the problem is not with people seeking this out. The problem is with, uh, you know, what, what they're doing at these camps. I mean, it, it was kind of the camp sounded, uh, you know, the camp was was encouraging gay behavior it was it was really bizarre um and uh you know and and there've been all sorts of sort of uh just just strange uh suggested treatments and things like that at one point jim dobson suggested that fathers who are concerned that their sons might um be gay should shower with them like what? <laughs> I mean, just strange stuff, right? But that doesn't mean that someone that says, you know, I'd like to help you with this, and and um, since you came to me for help, um, you know, let's see what we can do with this. Um, it he's just trying to help people that come to him looking for help. Um, uh, and and the reality is is that if you read the Bible, um. People, you know, will say, you know what, you can't tell me that 
this is okay. This isn't what God wants for me. And, um, and, and God wants better for me. And so I want that better. All right. And it doesn't work with everybody. Some people, you know, in, in a sense, and, and you know, this is, it, it's hard to come up with a, with an analogy that's not going to offend anybody. All right. But the best analogy that I've come up with is like alcoholism. All right. Some people are alcoholics. All right. And you can, you can develop strategies on how to deal with it. Like not drinking, right? And, and staying away from places where you're going to be tempted to drink and having sponsors and, and, you know, and different things like that following a 12 step program, right? Does that mean that you stop being an alcoholic? No. That's why you know, I was called a recovering alcoholic, right? And it's a lifelong process, right? So, you know, for a lot of people, being gay is going to be like that. It's a question of what do you do with it? Different people are tempted by different things. Somewhere along the line, you know, people need, we need, they're, they're, we keep hearing about the need to have tolerance. Somehow or another, we need, people need to learn to be tolerant, which means allowing people to be wrong. You yeah. know, I mean, let's be honest. Michelle Bachman, for whatever news she's getting now, it's not going to be running for president in another year. She is not going to win. She is not going. She she may come str- strong out of Iowa, which means what? You know, we've had a lot of people who've come strong out of Iowa and gone nowhere. Um, hmm. you know, and I don't think it's going to make any difference there to either. Um, she doesn't have enough background. Ugh. We don't need another legislature, leg, legislator. Um, see, I've got a problem with this idea that if you're not running or for president already, there's no way you can make it by next November. Do it. I mean, I still remember the days when, you know, you could get in in Mar, you know, February and March in the year of the election and be okay. So you I might have, be better off. Man, I have problems with these two year long elections. Mm-hmm. I saw something today. Somebody said, you know, some guy broke out of jail and, you know, and just popped up and said, only 16 more months till the election. And he ran back into the prison. Uh, <laughs> get away from it. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of homosexuality and Lutherans. Um, dum, dum, dum. A year ago, uh, when I was at the LCMS convention, this issue came up. Because in 2009, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America voted to ordain practicing gays and lesbians who were in partnered, uh, partnered, affirming, lifelong, uh, monogamous relationships or something like that. And they were called palms. Uh, anyway, so, um, last year, uh, while well, at the, 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 the convention, uh, the question came up, how can we continue to work with the ELCA and still have integrity, you know, with, with, with theological integrity? And the um, former president, Jerry Kishinick, had come up with a, a – convened a group, and they come up with like 15 points that, that concern them and, and things that need to be explored. And they wanted to get the Senate conven- – the Senate wanted to give them – the new, uh, the Presidium and the C- Commission on Theology and Church Relations, three years to kind of work through this. Well, then the, uh floor amendment came forward to make it one year, which I didn't think was really good, but I voted against it, but it passed anyway. Um, so now the, the year is here. It is July this year, and so they've got to come up with a report, and so the report came out. Uh, you can find it on the LCMS uh, website, lcms.org. And it's about a 15-page document, but borrowing liberally, interestingly enough, from the document that Jerry Kishinick wrote, uh-huh. which shows there wasn't so much difference between him and Matt Harrison on this, this issue anyway. Actually, I think Matt Harrison helped write the original, the, 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 the report that was there. So, you know, and he had input on both documents then. 
And basically it, it said, look, we are in doctrinal conflict here. We have been in doctrinal conflict. We've kind of put up with the doctrinal conflict, but this is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, it's not that it was just over this issue. This was sort of the extreme thing that we never thought would that it would go this far and you know the the bigger issue is is our view of of the bible all right our basic views of scripture and things like that so the lcms has what are called uh recognized service organizations an rso um most people would call these parachurch ministries they're not part of the denomination but they are affiliated with it. Now, there are some of those which are strictly um, uh, Lutherans for Life, which is pan-Lutheran, but mostly Missouri Synod. Um, there's one in, in, in St. Louis called Family Shield Ministries. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the Lutheran Association of Missionary Pilots, I think is, is, is another one that works with uh, people, uh, uh, Native Americans in Alaska. And there are some other groups. Uh, there are a lot of them which are recognized as, um, uh, which are social service organizations. Uh, for example, Lutheran Social Services of New England. Um, there are some that are not. In Illinois, there's Lutheran Social Services of Illinois, which is associated with the ELCA, and Lutheran Child and Family Services, which is associated with the LCMS. Yeah, um, so you so, can't just go with, you know, names like Lutheran Social Services. You have to look at... Um, it's the same in Iowa that it, uh, Lutheran Services is ELCA and, uh. I did not know that. Yeah, I think that one's also. Oh, it's Lutheran Family Services. Right. Is, um, is the LCMS one. It's, it's similar to that in Wisconsin too. And, um, so now up here, ours is a joint ELCA and LCMS ministry social organization uh, and together they confront all of them are kind of members of Lutheran Services of America and uh, one of the, which is I've been told is the largest social service organization in America we don't serve their kind um, what your droids they'll have to wait outside we don't want them here I'm of a bunch of different minds about this and I'm not sure which one I come down on um, I mean, first off, I believe this is the kind of work we should do. It, you know, this, the, you know, we, uh, uh, up here, it's kind of, this is all a merger. One Lutheran group had a retirement home. Another Lutheran group had a, had an orphanage. Uh, another Lutheran group had a, um, um, another type of ministry. And they all kind of just kind of merged into Lutheran social services. Um, However, in our adoption, I didn't really necessarily see anything really Lutheran about it. Mm-hmm. We worked through them because we wanted to support them. We didn't have a prayer. We never had a devotion. You know, if it was for the fact that it said Lutheran on the building, I couldn't see anything Lutheran about what we were doing. Right. Well, you know. And I asked a young girl who was at the girls' home in uh, Brockton. You know, and she said, just like any other group home. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, so why is this a Lutheran group home if there's nothing particularly Lutheran about it? If the people who are working there are not necessarily Lutheran? Yeah, well, you know, and, and it, sometimes it's a matter, just a matter of who owns it. Um, other times, you know, it makes a difference. Uh, for instance, we have a, a group home um, not too far from here. And, um, they will, uh, if anybody that wants to, because our congregation is specifically connected with that group home, anybody from that, um, from that group home that wants to come to church here at Shepherd of the Ridge, they will provide rides for them and they will send a a worker along with them, um, to, uh, you know, sort of chaperone or, or whatever the term would be. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, and to drive, but, uh, then, and, and so we've got just about every Sunday, um, we've got one or two, uh, from there. And, um, 
if somebody wants to go to church somewhere else, they're welcome and encouraged to do so, um, but they won't provide them a ride. Um, we are also, um, we've at various times had uh, representatives from, from our congregation go in and do Bible studies there, um, but and, and, and different things like that, that we, we try to work with them. And we're, and we're always looking for things that we can do in connection with them. Um, and, and ways to, to, uh, give their residents opportunities to, to connect with us. And, um, you know, and, and that's a, that's a pretty close relationship. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, uh, number one, we have some people there that are family members of, um, of some of our members here. Um, you know, sort of, there, so this is family connection. Um, and so, the, you know, some of those people are, are members. We also have uh, some people that just have really big hearts and, uh, and really want to, um, want to reach out to these people and share God's love with them. And, uh, so, you know, they really try hard to, um, to find ways to, to show them that love, to, to bring them here, um, to, you know, things like, uh, getting them in confirmation classes and things like that. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, it, we see it as an opportunity. Um, but then, you know, when you get into things like adoption, you know, when we were in, uh, when we were in Iowa, some of our, the caseworkers that we dealt with through, um, as, as foster parents worked with Lutheran services of Iowa, which is the ELCA one. Um, and I never, I mean, this was a state foster care, um, uh, system. And, um, and so they were involved in that and, and it had nothing to do with being Lutheran or, you know, there was no mention of that. It was, that was the name on the building and that was about it. Right. Um, so it's going to be anyway, so we're, we're trying to figure out exactly where this is going to, um, you know, wind up working and stuff. It's, you know, Herb Mueller, uh, the first vice president of the LCMS, says, it's complicated. We're trying to take a nuanced and caring approach to all these situations. Um, now, David McCoy, and quote, ecumenical officer for the ELCA, said, we are deeply concerned about the ministries of care that might be challenged by the recent action of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. <laughs> yeah, it's all your fault. You see, if you guys would just go ahead and let us do what we want and work with us anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it has nothing to do with anything they did. <laughs> no, huh? And their decision had nothing to do with it. And he's their, he's their, uh, their ecumenical officer. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, they talked to all their ecumenical partners before they made the decision, you know. <laughs> you know, they, they they sat down with every one of them, had a conversation, you know, wrong. I heard from, you know, there's a lot of talk when they did, a lot of their, their, their ecumenical partners, the, the Methodists and the Episcopalians and, and, and uh, the Presbyterians were like, you never said a word to us. You know, where's this put us now? Mm-hmm. Um, now, uh uh, what we're doing here in New England. Um, because they saw the handwriting on the wall. I saw the handwriting on the wall. I mean, anybody who didn't, you know, anybody who's shocked by this. <laughs> needs to get a new wall. rock to uh, crawl uh, under. Cause... <laughs> yeah, he, he, he needs to, you know, figure things out, Reverend McCoy. Anyway, so, um, you know. So what we did was, uh, so, so Lutheran Social Services, um, just became independent. It is no longer owned by the, by, by the New England District or the New England Senate of the ELCA. It is an independent agency. The Board of Directors has the same makeup on it it did before. Um, and everything else is pretty much the same. But by no longer being officially affiliated, in terms of ownership, well, then we don't have to worry about RSO status. Now, on the other hand, it does hurt. A few, many, many moons ago, back in 1982, uh, the uh, uh, LSS was hurting financially, 
and we managed to get them a line of credit through Lutheran Church Extension Fund, which is kind of a LCMS bank uh, that, that that helps build uh, support ministries and stuff. And uh, and that would be something you'd get as an RSO. They would no longer qualify for that. Mm-hmm. They paid that loan back a long time ago. However, with losing RSO status, you know, they would have to find a new lender uh, within a year. That's kind of LC. L- LCEF could call the loan the next day. <coughs> Their practice is to give you up to a year <coughs> to find it, uh, find new funding or something like that. But that, so that's, that's, the, and they wouldn't loan any new money. Mm-hmm. But that's the, um, you know, extent of it. Now, the um, immediate decision, however, that is going to begin, um, is going to stop the practice of tr- joint training of military chaplains with the ELCA. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and that goes back to the 1940s. That goes back to World War II when we uh, joined with the national, what was called the National Lutheran Council to train Lutheran chaplains for the, for the armed services. Um, and I hate to see that change happen. I really do. It really, uh, uh, it's a very sad thing. But again, um, I've had, we've had two or three young men from the ELCA want to become LCMS pastors. And, you know, there's just such a difference in the whole theological viewpoint. It's, it's, this is, this is, this is, you know, the, the, the gay marriage thing is kind of the, I mean, the, yeah, the, and, and, and it's just kind of the, the, the final thing. But, they're saying with the military's planned repeal of don't ask, don't tell, and the ELCA's view on gay ordination, which could have then a partnered gay person coming into the chaplaincy under Lutheran auspices, the LCMS said, we just can't, we can't allow that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what it comes down to is the whole, um, you know, view of, of homosexuality is, um, that's sort of the face of this whole body of of um of of the view of the Bible and, and and things like that, um because in Missouri Synod we say, all right, it, you know the Bible is God's word, and so whatever if the Bible says it, whether you like it or not, it's the word of God, and you know you can't argue with God, you can, but He's going to win, and um you know and and so um with the ELCA it it varies from pastor to pastor there's no sort of official yeah the bible's the word of god and and um what's sort of taught prominently in in the seminaries and and is the uh, prevailing or um the the growing tendency is something like the bible contains the word of god and um and so you know this is really hard and i i know that we've got some um some ELCA uh, pastors and and members that watch our show, and so I'd really love to hear from you guys and your and your thoughts on this. Um, this is really this is hard for people on both ends um, because you know the other thing is I know that that there's quite a few pastors in the ELCA that they don't like all the stuff going on either, all right, and they really struggle with it and they find themselves, you know, what do you do when your um when you find yourself in a situation where your church body is moving in a direction that um that you find to be harmful or or uh not according to God's word and um you know and the struggles with that and and for that matter that's not just going on in the LCA that's going on in a lot of church bodies i mean mm-hmm. you know you mentioned the episcopalians one of the articles that i didn't pull this for this week was that in New York, since gay marriage has been legalized, uh, the bishop there is telling all of the, um, all the gay pastors that have, um, live in partners to go get married. So you're not living in sin anymore. Um, where are you getting your definition of sin from? (laughs) Well, uh, basically though, you know, I would, I would agree with him. I would say, you know, um, you know, we publicly accountable, lifelong monogamous relationships. That's it. Palms. Um, okay. Now, and, 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 and up to this point, that could be a, a private blessing. But now it's legal. You must get married. You must obey the law. Mm-hmm. Whether, I mean, I can, I think his position, I, I disagree with his position, but I understand the logic 
and the consistency of his position. Well, yeah, it's consistent. Right. It's not consistent with the Bible, but it's consistent with the position. Right. So I think I think that makes perfect sense. Now, um, you know, uh, I just, you know, I, I yeah, I, I don't know where this is going to wind up. Uh, I am interested. In, I would be very interested in seeing what uh, um, some of our ELCA uh, friends have to say about it. I did have a on July fourth. We had a Spoke Folk group here. Spoke Folk is a um, Lutheran based organization. Uh, and kids, you go bike touring. And one of the people who took part in the, the, the tour was a retired ELCA pastor. And uh, I was talking with him. Uh, and his name also happened to be Jim. And he said, he goes, oh, he says, uh, I'm glad I retired before 2009. He says, I don't know what I would do right now. He says, but uh, he says, uh, actually, I'm thinking about attending an, e- uh, an LCMS church. Says because uh, I would think I'd feel much more comfortable there. And I said, you know, what can they do to you? You know, is there, you know, a requirement, you know, for you to, you know, draw your pension to remain on the LCMS roster? You know, uh, you know, I mean, we we have a requirement if you want to be on the LCMS roster, you have to be, you know, you have to you you have to attend an LCMS church. But if you're retired, you still get your pension, everything. You can leave and join. I know, I know, if he retired. LCMS guys who went and joined ELCA congregations, they're still getting their pension. You know, you can't cut that off. You're vested in that. They have no, I, I think you can even be resigned from the ministry at this point if you're vested and still receive pension for the years you served. Hmm. Oh. You know. Yeah, but it's tough. It's, it's tough for pastors. It's tough for congregations. Um, you know, and we've talked about losing your property and all kinds of things like that. Um, and but it's also this this whole question of of what ways can we work with the other organizations that we disagree with? You know, when when I was in Iowa, I was in the board of directors of a of our local food pantry, right? Um, and it was pastors from all different denominations um, that were on this board of directors because it was run by the local ministerium, and um, and we worked together and and. While we, uh, you know, had a lot of things that we disagreed on as far as our understanding of the Bible goes, um, you know, we all agreed that people that are hungry should have food, and and that you know Jesus commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Right. I think it's a care. I think it's a thing. And you know, it comes back to how can we do this with theological integrity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a very difficult thing. By the way, the other thing I think that's very frustrating to me about this whole thing. Uh, myself is, um, you know, where is this going to lead some of our our, our um, people who are in the military? You know, uh, my um, daughter, when she was at uh, Relax in Jackson, uh, attended the Lutheran service, and it was an ELCA uh, uh, pastor. My son, when he was down at uh, Fort Lost in the Woods in Missouri, um, same thing, it was an ELCA chaplain. And they both enjoyed the, the sermons. They said, the, the, you know, the guys were very good. Um, and uh, they were very, you know, when Josh was at Fort Knox, um, the guy who's currently the head of chaplains for the LCMS was the uh, chaplain there. And uh, he enjoyed that service. And, you know, so, you know, and, and, and all the Lutherans were welcome to commune. And, um, you know, and, and, and there's been that kind of policy. So, where that comes is going to be an interesting situation to see. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's part of the, unfortunately, just part of the world in which we live in now. So, but interested always in your viewpoints, your thoughts, you can always write, get a hold of us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. Yep. Or just if you're watching this on YouTube or one of the other video sharing sites, just leave a comment there and, uh, and then watch our next episode uh, to get our, uh, our response to that. Right, which will be in two weeks, and then um, don't know if we'll be on August. It's going to be August seventh. We will definitely not be on August fourteenth because I will not be in town, and I don't know if I'll be in town the twenty-first or not. I think I would be back in time. I don't know. So if you're not subscribed to the podcast, um, you yeah, know that's the best way to know when we've got new episodes coming out, and uh, the podcast has uh, better. Uh, quality than the um, you know YouTube and things like that sort of downgrade the quality a bit. 
And, uh, so if you want the, the best quality, uh, the content doesn't get any better, but the, you know, the video <laughs> gets a little better. Um, and then, and you could just uh, find it at any of your, uh, any of your favorite, uh, podcast directories. Uh, iTunes is probably the most popular. So, and you can just find us there. Um, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, stay cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as always look out for, for the people, uh, speaking of loving your neighbor as yourself, you know, think about, uh, those people that are in the heat and see what you can do for them. Um, you know, I just heard a statistic that more people die from extreme heat than all other weather related phenomena combined. And, uh, on the other hand, I don't slip on it, I don't have to scrape it off my car, and I don't have to shovel it. <laughs> this is true. Although my, my car window fogged up horribly yesterday, um, and I, I had to wait and let my defroster run just to, to clear them off, cause just from the, just because it, it fogged up because it was so hot. I yeah, really won't ask you what you were doing to fog up the windows. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's all we have. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Good night and God bless.